We're going to do the infrared first because it shows and works better when it's not hotter outside. So right off, right there. So And the reason we're talking about infrared is because people say, oh, well, there's no sense in running and hiding in the wilderness because they have ways of finding you. They can go out there with their helicopters and their heat seeking, and, and they can fly out there, and they can find you and pinpoint right where you're at. And so I'm just going to stay right here in the city. I've heard that stated. In other words, I'm all, we're already defeated, so we're not going to try and escape. Um, number one, um, help me, Matt, to make this as short as possible. But I want to share about what happened, what I learned years yeah. ago. Um, oh, you could do that first. What? You could do that first. OK, we got that. OK. So many years ago, back in the 90s, um, I was trying to think of the way to do this. Long story short, there was a friend of mine who his wife got pregnant and it wasn't him. And he, and he was in the church. He was very distraught. And he decided that he was going to walk out into the woods and just think about, think this through. What do I do? Do I get rid of my wife? You know, he's got two, two other young children, and, you know, he's, he's a very distraught man. Well, the head elder, head elder of the ch church, one of the two head elders of the church, states, and over thing, er, things got overstated, that he had decided that he was the scapegoat, and he was going out into the wilderness to die. He told this to the officers that came. So we ended up there a... He was just in the woods taking a break. Um, we ended up with a fiasco. We had um, two buses there full of prisoners that they were using for searching. We had numerous, um, and I say we, we were out camping one of our no weekends out, and we missed it. I get home on Sunday mid-morning, sun mid to late, it was around noon, something like that. My answering machine is full of messages from the sheriff's department and from a federal agent. And demanding that I immediately call them. And so I call, and I, they're like, what do you want? And I said, this is Mark Robanski. Just a minute. Boom, boy, I got action. I was like, whoa. And I'm thinking, what did I do? And I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know any of this other had happened. So anyway, I'm told that I immediately need to go to the residence um, where they were at, that there would be um, men there waiting for me. So I get there. And I find myself sitting in there at their dining room table in their house. And I have the sheriff of the county. I have two federal officers. And I also have, and how this got to be federal level so fast, only, I don't know, it, it amazes me. The, the mother of the man that had gone for the walk into the woods to clear his mind over all of this had flown in from California. She was a doctor's um, wife, lots and lots of money. She, her, her husband was an educator. Um, so we're sitting there at the table, and I'm like, what's going on? I mean, I didn't know why I was there at that point. I didn't know what was happening, and my friend had and they said, we're told that you're best friends with um, this man. I'm going to leave him unnamed. And that, uh, um, that you would know more about him than, than anybody else, maybe besides his wife. And I said, well, we've not been friends long, but yeah, we're, we're friends. And so to shorten the story after some talk for a while and I find out what's going on, which I've kind of briefly given you, I also discovered there was another gentleman that was sitting there at the table. He was quite quiet. And the mother of this man says to him, look, money's not an object here. She says, why don't you bring in one of your helicopters, heat-seeking um, units, and find him. Enough of this stuff with a bunch of men running around that could care less with their dogs and prisoners and all of this. I want him found. How much do you want? I'll get my checkbook. You want a million dollars? I'll write you a check. Right now. Whatever it takes. She says, money's no object for me. And he goes, ma'am, he said, I don't care how many millions you write a check for. If he doesn't want to be found, 
we can't find him. And I went, hmm, interesting. And I still didn't know who this man was that was at the end of the table at that point. And I said, seriously, so you can't and, and do that? And he goes, no, no. He says, there's no way. I was like, oh, OK. And as time went on over the, the process of that day, I learned um, he is the same man. Anybody here heard of Ruby Ridge back in the 90s in, in uh, Idaho? OK, he was the law enforcement officer that was in charge of that whole fias fiasco, may I say. And I find myself, he's, I mean, I'm sitting at the left side of the table, and he's on the end of the table. He's like right there to my left. And they wouldn't let you out of the house. And yeah, they would not let me leave. I was, I was not guilty, but I was also under restraint. They would not, I mean, I wasn't handcuffed or anything like that, but they had told me that I was to be right there and for questioning. And they, believe me, they drilled me like you wouldn't believe. He did as well. Um, so he also was the same man who was uh, directly involved with the organization and whatnot of Waco, probably another term that you've all heard. And he's the man that's telling me if he don't want to be found, we can't find him. And as he and I talked, things relaxed, the tensions relaxed from both sides. I wasn't quite so scared because I was thinking, am I in trouble? What are they going to do to me? And once I realized that, no, I really am not in trouble, and that he was, he, he actually told me and explained, he says, I don't even understand why I'm here. He says, I don't think this is what they're making it out to be, a religious fanatic that's out there. He says, I really don't think that's the case. But he says, I'm here. I'm in charge. I have to be here until this is resolved. And so we talked a lot. And I learned a lot from him. And it really does come down to if you don't want to be found. Now, this is setting God aside, OK? This is talking physically speaking. If you don't want to be found, they won't and cannot find you. So what do we do? Well, I learned a lot from him that day that I tucked away in my um, hat, you might say, um, and different techniques and things that he had said. I did offer, by the way, I said, will you let me go look? I think I can go out and at least talk to him. I don't know if he'll come back with me. but. Um, I should be able to at least check on him, make sure that he's OK, find out. They would not let me leave the house. And I was not allowed, although interestingly enough, he wasn't far from the house. Now keep in mind, they've got two school buses full of prisoners out there that are walking about, oh, I'm going to say just like this distance apart, lines through the woods. As a tree comes, the arm comes down, somebody jogs around the tree, comes back. They're going through the combing, the woods, doing gridding sections with these groups. Plus, they've got the dogs out there tracking and whatnot. What? Yeah, six, 60 prisoners are Yeah, 60 so you, prisoners You get wise. that. So you have this. This is six foot. So you take six foot times six, 60. 360 feet wide, isn't that? Yeah. So um, they, were, they were serious about finding this guy. Well, here's how close he was. While we were sitting at the dining room table, he snuck in the back door while the prisoners were out searching for him and left a note laying on the, dining, on the, kitchen, ta on the kitchen counter. Saying, call off the dogs. He says, call off the dogs and I'll come back. Um, so anyway, literally, and by the way, this guy was not a woodsy wise man who had years of experience in the LA. woods. He was from LA. He'd <laughs> lived in he'd lived in LA most of his life. He was raised he there. The he had lived in that country place where they were at. They were in the country. Um, they'd been there three years at that point in time, and he'd learned more about woods things from me in that three year period that we'd known each other. I think I, we'd known each other probably about two years, I think, something like that. Um, so anyway, it, uh, and he definitely was not a, he was not militaristic. He did not own a gun. He um, was just, 
a city slicker trying to learn how to live in the country, I guess you could say. Yeah. And yet he was able to do this. And with that, to me, that was really encouraging to realize that it is possible to avoid um, some of these things. So to start with, between that um, incident and the um, being on the ranch, we learned what causes people to um, be found, number one, is movement. If there's aircraft overhead or if there's somebody in the area that might be out there looking with their binoculars or whatever, just stop. Um, I have Matthias trained that and literally if we were to go for a walk, if we had like a I wooded like area here. I would share something short on that. We were at a camp meeting and I was trying to get that point across to some of the kids and I had told them about four hours prior, four hours prior, keep your eyes open and watch me. I will disappear on the walk. And they were all, they were like watching me like crazy. All I, I walked over about halfway through the walk. I said, look at that bird. And they're all looking at the birds. I just backed up into the woods. Done. 15 feet off the trail and he disappeared. And they couldn't. I was wearing blue jeans and a red shirt. And they didn't see him. And they, they, they turned around literally like within 10 seconds and I was gone. And it's the fact of no movement. And, and it wasn't like technique. he like climbed down in underneath a log no. or something and hid. No, I was, was standing next to a tree peeking out watching him. <laughs> so. Okay. So, but it's the movement because movement catches your eye and you'll see that. If, if I were to walk out here to the, those trees over there, which I don't recommend we do, there's a golf course between here and there, you might catch a golf ball somewhere. Um, but if, we, if I were to stand over there and not move, and you knew I was over there, but you didn't know where, dressed just as I am, it's not likely you would spot me. And I might not be more than three feet back into those trees. Yeah. But if I moved three or four feet, immediately the numerous of you would be, there he is. So movement. So first instinct that we want to do if we're evading is run. That's what everybody wants to do. The minute you run, you just made yourself a big target. Yeah. But then color is a distinguishing difference between the background and you. Um, Shape and color is also taken into account. Yes. Yes. If you were Shape and color. I say those kids must be blind or something. I had I had like a. I had a red and black, uh, like western shirt, and the like, it was a dark red, it was not, not a bright. But it it was, wasn't bright. It was red. almost kind of the color of your shirt with some black stripes, and um, it but just the color does fall, make a trip. No. no, it there was leaves behind me, and I was standing next to a pine tree. Color does make a huge difference. Yes. Um, one thing we recommend, stick to um, earth tone colors. It makes it so easy right now because that's what's in style, yeah. is earth tone. Yes. Look at Melanie's dress. Does that look like camo? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It is. <laughs> this is very much... The other thing, go away from solid colors. Solid colors outline you. So get something that's a little patterned. And it's amazing how much you will just fade into the background of the woods. Yeah. So, um, so what we're doing. Yeah, color, color makes a huge difference. So what we're going to do with, uh, um, and I'm going to let Matt talk to us about it, but we, he's got two drones setting up here. He'll tell us about those in a minute. Um, the, uh, which one is this? This, this one. one. Yes. This drone here is infrared capable. Matt's, um, well, I'll let you tell yeah. about that. So it's infrared capable. What we're going to do is we're going to, we need a volunteer, so we want some, and of course, whoever volunteers to be our helper, you're going to, we only need, we need one. Devon, you did it last time. Um, to, and you're going to miss out because what's going to happen is what you see here, this is actually Matt's controller for his drone that you're looking at here on the TV. So we'll be in touch. Melanie's going to go out there with them. I'll be in touch with her on the phone so that we can coordinate. We're going to take a um, emergency, emergency blanket. blanket that we've Which, used before. This, 
This is a emergency blanket poncho, a wool blanket. One of these. And one of, we shared this with our pack. This is like an emergency blanket slash tarp. We shared about this the other day. It's a little heavier material. And a plain old tarp. And a plain old tarp, even with a few holes in it, because Matt stoked the fire up and it, he burnt holes in it um, in my tarp. So anyway, what we're going to do is send, send them out. So hang on, before you go out, Matt's got to share a couple of things first before we... So basically with these drones, this drone here is a commercial drone. Um, it's about a $6,000 drone, not counting batteries. Yeah. Um, I am licensed with the FAA. Currently, we are in um, M29er Airfield, about a mile away over there. What type of drone would that $6,000, how would it be identified if someone says, oh, I'm interested in that? What would that well, for starters, if they're interested in it, you have to have a license, commercial license, to own one of those. Okay. That one is open to the public. That one's just a videography drone. They're the DJI Mavic 3 series. That's the classic. This is the Enterprise Thermal. Enterprise. So the Enterprise models, unless you have your license, you can't get them. And at the other camp meeting, he said, I'll, I'll post this on the website. Yeah. But the FAA lady said, don't do that. That's like giving somebody your driver's license. Yeah. So he'll flash so. this to you to show now, but yeah. you might post it. So basically, the licensing that he goes through with the FAA is the same thing a private pilot goes through to get their license. Um, he has to know basically this almost everything almost but how as to much. fly the airplane. The, air, the airplane. That's basic. And then how to how, the technology of my drone and what the rules for my equipment. So I have to learn all their rules and our, my rules. So uh, the reason I say we're in MT9 or airfield is um, I can fly here being I'm commercial. I have put in a um, um, notification. notification. It's a uncontrolled airspace. So it's easier to do it that way, so. Yeah, if this was a towered airport, he would not be able to fly here. Sometimes, it depends on Well, without getting location. special permissions. Yeah. Um, okay, so you've got that. So. I think we're ready. I think we're ready to. I'm gonna set this one out there. You'll be able to see them. You'll be able to see what they're doing. Will what he's going to do? Well, Matt's getting set up here. What he's going to do once once it comes up, you'll be able to see from the camera on the drone. And what we'll probably do is do a split screen where over one side you will see the infrared, the other side you will see video. So you'll be able to see what they're doing from the air of what they're, what's happening out there. And then, um, so let me get Melanie on the phone here so that I can tell her, be in communication, tell her what we want next. I'm getting this drone set up with satellites. She's calling my phone. Uh, okay. Just give us a second. Okay, so give us a moment here. Matt's getting things. Um, I'm trying to get this one set up with um, okay. so I can see if there's airplanes around. And then I'll take off with that one. Um, so what he's doing is his the one drone that he's set out there. That one's supposed to have it, but I haven't done. It's got an update that's missing. This, the drone, the control he has in his hands, which you're not seeing up here on the screen, um, this will tell him if there's any aircraft in the area so that um, we can watch to, to make sure we avoid. Um, we don't need a collision. Um, even a little drone can be a problem for an airplane. Um, and we don't need any uh, issues. How is he going to go with the drone? Um, legally, he can go up to 400 feet. And I am here too. And you, are you? I have permission to, yes. You got permission. So yes. we're going to, we can go up to, with a drone, you can go 400 feet what they call AGL, which is 400 feet above the ground level. Um, and landing. Okay, I got satellite on that one. Okay, you got what you needed there. Okay, so here we go. 
Uh, Brother Layton, I don't have audio from this one. She's still on there. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, we're up. So give us a moment here. He's going to get it switched over to, you're on the camera, but we're get, we'll switch over to. Where's your audio output? It comes out the HDMI, like last time. Last time it did. Um, it's, it's fine, I guess. Oh. No. I haven't put him in the tall okay. grass, which would be a better place. I was afraid of um, pick. Okay, so so what we want you to do is just so that with the ticks, stay in the mown grass. The mown grass is okay. hotter. What? Mown grass, is, mown grass hotter. is hotter. I want them over there if we're going to Okay, get a good so what I want you to do is take the tarp and lay the tarp out, the the regular tarp, in the, in the non-mown grass. The grass okay. is already picking up a lot of heat. Okay. Um, put the brown side up for us. Brown side up? Okay. So right now she's just setting out a tarp so they're not in with all the ticks because they're scared of them. Okay. Okay, we're going to do this on here. He, that's too hot. The mown grass is hotter, so he's, yep. he's having me. So you can stand on there, son. Okay. That's just a regular right. tarp that she laid out? Yes. yes, that's a regular tarp. Yeah. We'll show what the heat pattern is there. Okay, so Matt, switch over to the infrared. Okay, so the red there, what red is hot. The um, it doesn't get good readings. I prefer the they just red. do it on the grass. The I know they're not going to like it. What? Because the, the tarp is just as hot as he is. It is. It's That's showing the heat. Out here. That's what I tried to get him to do last time. Um, didn't want to do Melanie? It. Yes. The tarp is showing just as much heat as he is showing. He's going to have to go out in the grass, um, one of them. We're going to have to send you out in the grass, I guess, and do without the tarp and okay. do a tick check. So okay. just go beyond your tarp there. Um, All right. So because this is picking up the sun and making hot. So, yes. so basically what, go, what um, we had questions time. yesterday on it. What the infrared is, is there is a, it's um, a light ray, I guess you could call it, of heat. Um, that the sun admits okay. and also other... His feet are sticking out on our any side. Any heat admitted from anything has its frequency. And this camera can see those frequencies and give me the heat temperatures and differences of them. So, okay, now we are at 42 feet elevation from, from, the, above porch. The, gr from the porch level above ground. Um, so here's where he's at. We're picking up a little bit of heat. That is an emergency blanket. You can see Melanie standing here. The tarp is almost showing as much. So if she were not to move, literally, if she didn't move standing there, you might go, well, there's a hot spot there, but what is that? Unless you had an optical camera, you'd never see even what it was to look at. Um, so you could see the, the thermal blanket there, but you see how little heat and the black is cold. So it's blending in. So what about our subject under the... Um, where, where we can see his legs, I can see his heat. Yeah, where his, I think where his legs are, we're seeing a little bit of heat coming through. He's, he's squatted down. Yeah, his I can see. Under him. I, ca I can he's see. Under him. I can see it right there. Okay. That's the tarp. Yeah, okay. we could... We now could back. There you go. That pretty much cleared it away. So now, Matt, run up to about, say, 150. Oops, sorry. What colors it show if the heat shows on it? OK, so do you see this bar up here at the top? So the coldest is currently 64 degrees at black. And then it fades up through white, gray up into white, and then up into red at a hottest at 134, 34. which is this roof over here. So, so he's at 127 feet off the ground. There he is. There's other hot spots out in the grass because the sun's so on. So if we were ignoring this, 
with Melanie and her sample out there. If somebody flew over with that, okay, with heat seeking. Now, if they had a visual camera, this is going to pick up and show really well. Uh, Matt can switch, split the screen I for us. Under another one now. Um, yes, let's go ahead and switch. Um, okay, and pull out, have him just pull that off of there. Give us just a moment here. Okay, pull that off. Let us, Matt, go to the infrared. Let us see it, what, it, what he looks like there without anything. So you see the spots? He's got black on, so he's going to be soaking up the Have him the do like a, a laying, laying position um, where his arms are out so they can see the heat print. No, let's not make him lay down in that. Okay, okay, so go ahead. Let's put a wool blanket over him. Yes, sir. So now, and we're doing this out in the open so it's easier for you to see. If you were in the trees a little bit, okay, you see how quickly and easily things disappear. Okay, zoom out. Matt zoomed in pretty good there. At Go up to your 100 and whatever and, and zoom out. You're at 7x. No, I'm not. Aren't you? You're getting that mixed up again. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so we're 190, just 180 feet. So you can still see a little bit of heat there. There's a hot spot there. Quite a bit of hot spot. Um, with, with the wool blanket. Um, okay, Melanie, go ahead and pull that off of him. Let's let's go with the poncho. 105 is his. Um, yeah, 103, 104. It's kind of red, isn't it? So yeah, and the red, of course, is we're ah. looking at the. Um, a lot more temperature. Obviously, even if you were. Um, out in the open, in an open field, if you had anything to throw over you that wasn't reflective, shiny, let's say that wool blanket that's a green blanket, and you threw it over you, you curled up on a little ball, it's likely that you may not even be seen. Or if you have on neutral colors, like Melanie with her, her clothing, if she were to curl up in a ball, it's going to be a hot spot, but it's not going to have the form of a human. That's the key thing. If, if you're laid there okay. where... He's sitting in his poncho now. Okay. So there's the poncho. It's actually picking up a lot of heat off of it today, coming right through it. Either, either his heat coming through it or the sun is heating it up on the outside. And so it's showing the... Uh, Oops. Um, showing the temperatures there. Um, this is like 100 degrees. Yeah. That one spot there. Yep. So that is, and we're, we're 58 feet off the ground. If Matt were up higher, that would become much, much smaller. We're st he's staying close so you can actually see it. You know, it, and helicopter's going to go through it probably at about 600 so feet. Matthias, over to the um, far side of me, the right side, and I'm facing the subject. There is an old machine in the trees, a tree line. Can you see how much heat you can get off of that, looking at that over there? Um, it's over here. Over here, not that tree, there. Is it putting, right there. Is it putting off 100 degrees or bar? There's the boat. There's the end of the lodge. Here's the trailer down okay. there. Go. No, go. Go, go on that the, piece of equipment. Uh, the tall grass. In the trees, there's an old yep. um, yellow machine there. Just about even. Well, it's even. Yeah, we're on it. On the edge of the grass. So Set how your, much heat does that radiate? What do we got for temperature there, Matt? 126. 127 is the hottest spot. So, so that metal is reflecting 27 degrees hotter than his little poncho was. Yeah, correct. But you okay. look at all these hot spots in the grass from just the fact that it's hot outside. Okay. And him. Yeah. And there's our. Now what's she putting over him? OK, what are you putting on him now? The thermal uh, 
um, thing you sleep in, the thermal blanket okay. with the silver now, side out, hopefully to reflect some sun and not soak up like the green. So that's would that's do. the silver side out? That's the silver side out, yes. You would never see that. No. I'm at 190 feet and he's right there. Go ahead and split screens so they can see um, with the so obviously, but, okay, so that silver thing laying there, if he doesn't move, that could be a piece of metal um, laying out there in the, in the grass. That could be all kinds of debris laying around. You're in tornado country. Who would have guessed there's a person under that, right? It's the, the roofing that fell off uh, three months ago in that tornado, right? Right. So you would never, you'd never notice, even with optical, and that's the thermal blanket that he has. That that's is a that, tarp. That is a, my thermal tarp. We can show you when we get back in. It's it's like a thermal blanket, but it's 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 a thermal blanket slash tarp. It's kind of a little heavier. That is working very very well. Okay, now let's put just the plain old tarp over him, and. I should have gotten a stick or something out there or a shovel handle, but put the regular brown tarp over him only and put the, yeah, put one side up and have him hold it, like hold his hand up to hold it off of him. She's putting the now that, side out. She's putting the shiny side out. It's just the silver, brown, brown and silver tarp, normal. Yeah, sorry. But look at that nice white spot on the. Uh, uh, now we're getting some heat. We're getting on it. a little bit of heat coming through. But we've got more heat over here on whatever that's, that's laying there reflecting than we've got here. Melanie, turn the tarp over. Um, put the brown side out for us now. Let's just look at the difference. But see, that totally eliminates. There's no form of a body there. But you don't want your tarp laid out perfectly nice and square because <laughs> it looks really dumb when you're flying along and you see something that's not It catches normal. your attention. Square is, yeah. is a man-made shape. It's not it's normal in nature. Right. OK, so that's brown set out. Yeah. So we're still picking up some heat. Brown, brown side out, and he's, it's doubled over, or tripled over, actually, and he's got his hands holding it up off of his head. OK. Yeah, we got no form okay. of a body there at all. Just It's just a hot spot from a tarp laying there. That could be just a tarp laying on the ground. The, and the slight bit of movement you could think of as wind blowing it that he's got going there. Okay, so pull that off of him and have Matt stay right there on it. Um, pull that off of him and have him walk out of there. We want to look at the ground now. Okay, it's not red, but see the white spot right there? See the white spot? That's, whoops, you went down too much, Matt. There we go. That spot, that's the heat signature left from his body that was there. Um, when Matt and I were doing this test, it happened to be just right for weather. Actually, we could see I had laid on my side, had my arms kind of out. I was laying on the tarp in the yard when we were doing a test with this. And we could, he could see the form of me laying there um, afterwards. So OK, thank you out there for your help. You are welcome to come back in. Glass. What? Glass. OK. Matt's going to do a couple of more things for us just to show and disprove some myths. Just give me a second. Our little subject is standing over by the tree. Can you see him? Get near the tree, son. Lean up against the tree. Can you see him there? Okay, let's go to infrared. You can see his legs moving. They're white, they're not red. Because the roofs are hotter than he is, but it's still. Now, if he stood there. If he stood still. Okay, now have him walk uh, towards the building. 
or run or come just have him come towards the the main building oh wow okay okay now come this way there it is okay point back down Matt so this is the heat signature that we're looking at so obviously very very obvious picking up a lot more heat out of the top of his head you look like a man walking they're, they're seeing you walk <laughs> So look at that. Just have him pause. Just stop and don't move for a moment. Look at that. Now he's moving his head. If he didn't move. Yeah, they're saying, where is he? He's right. Okay, he's now standing. have him walk to his right. Abruptly move. Okay. Isn't that amazing? So you see what I mean by if you move, whether they're using heat seeking or whether they're using visual camera, movement catches the eye. If, he's, if you're not moving. If I was on visual where he is right there, I could see him. With thermal out in the open, he disappears. Now do that in the woods and you've eliminated both. Right. Completely. Okay, you can pick things up and come on back in. Thank you. When the helicopters, when they're searching, do they use the infrared? But they use visual and, and infrared both. And they're using drones too. Um, and drones are becoming more popular. How does, does night vision? How does night vision, that's what you're looking at, is pretty much is, it works off of infrared signals. That's um, night vision with all the color? No. Oh, okay. This is visual. This is a visual camera. And night vision is thermal, correct? Um, um, night yes. vision is pretty much thermal. Matt can go out and fly at night and he can, with this. Okay. Um, I want someone to go over to the window real quick. We're seeing in a little I bit will. there. Um, don't go out, just open the window. So go ahead and put your hand on the... Okay. So one of the myths is that thermal at nighttime you can see through glass. Whoa. <laughs> That's what it looks like when you're looking at glass. We see nice reflections of what's behind us. We also see the reflection of the drone there. That's what thermal does to glass. So glass the, the thing, thermal. here's his point with that. Oh no. They can fly over my house and they can, in, on TV, this is where this come from. Mm -hmm. Oh, they can look right inside my house with their thermal imaging and they can see me walking through the house. Wrong. Not even. Uh -huh. What is it they showed, remember back the, the Waco fiasco, and they showed the people moving through the, they, they had something. Um, I think... It's called CGI. CGI, yeah. um, which stands. Computer imaged, it's com computer, computer generated, generated imaging. Thank you. Okay. Um, they do all kinds of things. They want to scare the people. They cannot see you through your roof. They cannot see through your windows. Um, and yes, the quality of what imagery and whatnot. Oh, yeah. I mean, the camera Matt has on his drone is... Let me, let me go up here. Is... There are drones open to the public or commercial pilot public um, with drones. You just give me a second here. I'm under the roof. There we go. Okay. I can't think of a movie, the one with Denzel Washington, where he is able to go and they see right through your home. Do you Anyone knows what I'm talking about? The it's all C yeah. I haven't seen it, no, but I've heard of it and no, that is not real. It's yeah. Um, so with this drone, six thousand dollars, there is open to the public, DJI makes well, commercial public, the ones that have commercial license, which is not too hard to get. Um, you can get yeah, just give me a second. Up to like thirty, forty thousand dollar drones that have way better infrared, way better zoom. Go ahead. I have, I work with the... Um, it's not on.
There's the runway. Let's see. Okay. I do work with video stuff. I can take a video footage off of his camera where he's taking a picture of your building and then I can insert pictures of uh, people or shadows of people and lock it to the motion in his video. Yeah, I've done the same thing. This is, this is what's called the computer generated imaging. It's, you're actually locking two separate images together that are not related to each other. But the, the video editing software locks the two together and causes them to track one with the other. And when you're looking at it on television, you cannot tell the difference between what was shot on the drone and what was locked together in the editing afterwards. Yeah. Also, about 12 years ago, they had this um, big thing where they said, we have mapped every single cave in the world. We know where every cave is. We know how long it is. We know how deep it is. We know how wide it is. And then lo and behold, we move to Tennessee and we get this Tennessee magazine every day or every, every uh, month. month. And Matt was looking through and he said, hey, mom, look. In there, they had a little old log cabin that's over in the... Um, on, in the Smokies, and it's actually on a state uh, place, and it was owned by one of the early governors of Tennessee who was friends of the Cherokee, and this thing has been deteriorating, and they decided to put money into it, and so one of the things they wanted to fix up was the fireplace and the hearth and all that, and they went to remove the hearth, and lo and behold, as they lift this slab of marble up, there's a, there's a passageway down under and it goes a mile and a half in to the very chamber what, that they know about. Um, and they, they were able to, they came to a wall and they found the secret pull string and they pulled it open. And there's the Cherokee Council room that's underground that they've known about for years, a mile and a half from this cabin. And suddenly they put all the pieces together because this friend of the Cherokees who was a... Um, uh, leader here in Tennessee, uh, I think he was a governor, he and his family during the Cherokee uprisings a hundred years ago I mean, used to disappear and nobody knew where he and his family went. Well the Cherokee would come and get him in the night and take his family. They literally, the Cherokee literally dug that passage up to his fireplace so that they could drop down through a tunnel and go a mile and a half into the council room and there they were kept safe the entire time there was ever an uprising against the white men's, against, uh, men against the Cherokee from the Cherokees and Matt's first thing he said to me after I read him the whole article because he was, he was like mom I can't read it fast enough he was getting too excited about it so I read it very interesting and he says that proves they're lying and I said what are you talking about he said, remember, years ago they told us that they had mapped every single tunnel, every single um, cave underground. They, they didn't know it. about this one until they lifted up the marble in this old um, cabin there in the state park and found this passageway a mile and a half long going to this thing. So, you know, they want to scare us to, to make us just give up and go passive and just give in. But our God will fight for us, and they're not as powerful as they want you to seem, so don't be afraid. So something else that goes along with this, which is actually kind of a um, scary technology, I guess you could say. Yeah. Because you never know uh, who's watching you. This drone has 56x zoom. The drones that um, DJI make, commercial, like drones for search and rescue and whatnot, one of them specifically, it's the M30. I think it has about 120x zoom. That, about half of that is optical, some of that is digital. So you can see here on my screen the uh, airport. I'm going to zoom in on the building. So if we were at the building, we wouldn't be able to see the drone. No. No, we wouldn't hear the drone. No. You would not hear the drone. You wouldn't see the drone. It's not focusing. Yeah, well, be, be still. You're zoom, you're... Why is it... I confused it. 
There it focused. Now go on in. By the way, that is about a mile and a quarter away. So that gives you an idea of, so um, spin, why don't you spin around, Matt, and look down here at the building. Okay, and bring a zoom in right there on the table or something out I'll there. I'll zoom in on my drone. What? I'm zooming in on my drone. Okay, so there he is. He's zooming in on his drone. Now he's 280 feet in the air. 79. 279.9, yeah. You're drifting a little bit. Um, so you can get an idea. We're looking at that drone real close. From up there. From up from 280, 275 feet in the air. So. Sister White makes a comment, though. She says she saw the angels of God wafting their wings around the righteous. And now we might know why. So this kind of technology is just kind of so, not workable. Yeah, and I don't, we don't want to leave that point out. So what we've been sharing you, with you is the physical realm. Now, if we stand under the shadow of the Almighty, and we have God on our side, above and beyond the physical realm, you can see where that level would take us. And the reason we take the time to share something like this is we're trying to, I guess I would say, take out some of the fear factor that has been built and that is out there that there's nothing we can do. They could see whatever we do, wherever we go. And yeah, we've, we got our dumb phones in our pockets. And yes, they can track you with these things very well. They can listen to you and all of that. Um, they know, but I, I would hope that everybody would have enough common sense that if you're in a situation where you're not wanting to be found, you're not going to rely on your taking this with you. And they fly very well. So, with this. so by being, um, I was just wondering if where are we at for time here. I was thinking about one more thing. So it's ten o'clock. Um, we got half an hour yet. Matt, um, I was trying to think, where's the closest? Woods. Woods. Down Just there. down the deal? Yeah. OK, I'm going to go for a little, um, let, me, you, let me call you. I'm going to go for a little jog down there. Go up, okay. follow me down there with infrared, and let me go into the woods. Just as I'm dressed, no, no shelter, I'll keep, we'll, we'll stay in touch by phone here. and. I want you to see what the woods will do. Um, um, yeah, there we go. He had, what's that? Do I need to turn off my microphone? I guess when I get far, far enough away, it'll be okay. Okay, with pine trees? Uh, a survivalist told us okay. one time that if you're out in the woods, hold on to a uh, pine tree and, and lean up against it and hold on. And okay, track me on the thermal, man. I'm mm, yeah, down the road. Yeah, probably. Okay. So he is heading down the road. I'm going to fly out there real quick. Okay, the question was asked, what about winter time when there's no leaves on the trees? Um, Matt and I, when we first got this, when he first got this thermal drone, we went out around the neighborhood um, in the evening, at, just after dusk, looking for rabbits and little animals, because you can see them. And when they'd go into the brush, um, we could not see them, even though there were no leaves on it. <coughs> it would break, the brush would break up their, their body heat to where we couldn't um, see the movement with the infrared. Um, he also, he's into um, search and rescue. And his first job was looking for a lost dog. And we looked in, in different areas. We found some deer under the trees. Now, these did have leaves, but we found the deer under the trees. There were a, a pod of them um, under some large oak trees. But the dog, we could not find. Um, we searched an area where it had last been seen. And then we told the lady, it's either, because we'd found the deer in the woods, we thought, 
it's either in a building, and it, this was a dog that wasn't used to the woods, so it's either in a building or one of these old cars on this place that had been abandoned. And so Matt took, asked the lady to go look at the barn that was there on the, on the um, edge of the, the forest that, w that we were looking in. And sure enough, there was the dog. She found the dog uh, there, but it ran away from her. So, and, but once it ran into the woods, we could not follow it. We could not track it because yeah, of the dense so. underbrush. So trees, yeah, head for trees, head for brush, uh, head for woods, and you have a much better um, chance of not being seen at all um, than you do out in the open. OK, so do you all see him? <laughs> Okay, so Dad, go ahead and walk back out towards the uh, edge of the woods. Okay, I'm going to come out just a little higher than where I went in. Okay. Because it's, I see it's a clearer trail. Okay, I'm about to come out. We see you. <coughs> there he is. There he is. Stop. I was, I was about to Okay, so go back in the tree line real quick. I want you to go just a slight bit in and then just stop. Okay, so you all see him walking in here, right? Okay, he's on. Go to your right a little bit, Dad. Okay, he's right there. Stop. He's right here. Yep. So now. Okay, there's another two feet. Yeah, come back. I'm trying to get a point. Come back a little bit. So even there if we he's are. right there, that's good. Pause. So even if he's, st stop, if he's standing right there, how are we going to tell the difference of whether that's a person or a tree Or limb? a tree limb. See, some of these tree limbs over here that are actually hot enough to be red, he's still showing white down there under the trees because it's cooler down there. And now with search and rescue, I look at all of those because I'm scanning the woods. So I normally run side by side view so I can go, oh. He's right there. That's how we found the deer. We saw those white spots. Hi, how are you, deer? <laughs> you are a deer, aren't you? Okay, you can come out. <laughs> yeah. So, so yes, the um, the trees you have a major advantage over. I feel sorry for those who are in the desert with only cactus nearby. So. I told a friend of mine that lives in Arizona that um, when it comes time that we have to leave, they're going to have to go in the desert. And she said, I know. But she's al they've already bought a house in Linden, hoping to move there when he can retire from his work out there. We are told in the, by the servant of the Lord that um, it's the wilderness areas and the fact that that desert area is very large and there are a lot, a lot of rocks. Yeah. And you know, I used to think you could be really seen. When I first went to Castle Valley when I was 16, that's in um, Moab, Utah, where the red mesas are. And I just looked out and all I saw was a flat piece of land. But you go walking out there and there's little dips and this and that, and it's easy to fall out of sight. You don't want to walk down one of the wadis, though, because if it rains in the LaSalle's, it can have water come through there and take you off your feet in a hurry. So, yeah. So, by God's grace, he will take care of his people wherever they are. So, obviously, color of clothing makes a big difference. Um, what you wear. Um, I was going to grab my jacket. Matt, you noticed, uses the blanket. You've probably seen him around here with it wrapped around himself. It actually keeps you cooler in hot weather to wear a wool blanket. This around. doesn't. No, this is. But this jacket, and I only have it because I got it used. But I'm going to blend in out there. If there's rain, I'm protected, obviously, without the hat. 
um, being on. It comes clear down to ankles. I get up here for the camera, for the camera and whatnot. Comes clear down to my ankles, almost to my ankles. So there's lots of things. You don't need have to get one of these. I'm not saying go buy an Australian Outback rain slicker, but what you do for clothing. But you notice the military quote camouflage pattern. For the most part, we stay away from. And the reason why, if I were walking into Walmart in military fatigues, and there's no military base nearby, people kind of tend to look. And, and being anything goes, it's not quite as bad as it used to be. But if I walk in like this, Matt was in Walmart, Walmart in Savannah with that on um, Tuesday. He when one person stairs. did say something, one of the register casters, she goes, aren't you hot? Because it was mild outside and it was 85, something like that. Um, wool will actually keep you cooler in hot weather. In and hotter weather. Want to take a nap? So, like I'll suck it. so clothing yeah. makes makes a big difference. The other thing that I can't stress enough, and that is we've learned, especially since being back here in Tennessee, that ticks go for lighter color. So they go for skin tones. They love the skin tones because they know they can draw blood from there. So in all honesty, you black folk are going to have less tick issue I, or maybe I should say you darker skinned are going to have less tick, tick issue than I would. I don't know. They get a lot of ticks. Um, they do get some, yes. I've seen it happen. It's not exempt because they pick up our heat signature or scent or something. But if you wear tan but pants. But if you wear light colored tan pants, you're like a tick magnet when you walk through the woods. If you wear dark colored pants, the dark browns, the the greens, yeah, like what he's wearing. And ladies, I noticed um, one of these places we went in Missouri a couple years ago um, to a camp meeting. I had a dress like this on, but I had a white slip on. And I felt something crawling, so I went to lift it up, and the inside of my slip was covered with seed ticks. So they went for the white slip. They weren't on my dress. They were on the white slip. So they see the white coming, and I think that's um, because of the belly of the deer, that's where they usually pick up and draw blood is from the belly of the deer because that's white. Also, if you're in a big group, white. just hang to the back because everybody else will pick them up first. <laughs> um, is there yes. a spray? Yes, she's asking spray. Um, what do we use? What do we use? Coconut oil mixed, um, mixed with. with, actually, I like the coconut oil that's way refined for this purpose, that is, that is always stays a liquid instead of going solid. Um, MT something other, I think it was. It's MTC? Yeah, MTC or something like that. Um, yeah, you can see it, get it at Walmart. I like that best because we don't use it internally. We use it externally. And we add essential oils to that. Um, things that citronella. they're not going to like. Citronella works almost the best. Tea Eucalyptus tree. works well. Lavender I have found they love. Peppermint they love. So we found that when we use those, it doesn't work. I like lemongrass in it. Oregano, be careful Don't how much, much you put on. I actually, my first trip to Tennessee here several years ago, I got into a seed tick nest. And I, I come in to check for ticks. And I pull up my pant leg to my knee. And I look, and it's just black dots everywhere, thousands on my legs, both legs up to about my knee level. And I'm looking at this, and all I can think of is somebody goes, oh yeah, it looks like you got into seed ticks. Seed tick to me said Lyme's disease, and I've got thousands of them on my legs. That's enough to create panic. Because see, out west, out west the ticks come, and they're there for um, usually a couple of weeks till we get a 70, a couple of days at 70 degrees or so. And they're gone for the year. They're done. They don't get worse through the summer. 
So I look at it, and it's like, what do I have? What do I have? How do I get these off? And I'm trying to pick, and they're so little, and I'm with a little pair of tweezers. They weren't dug in yet, but because I'd just gotten into them. Like, what do I do? Well, I got the idea of, because I had some oregano oil. So I <laughs> filled up my hand with oregano oil, and I start rubbing it on. And those ticks in seconds just went poof. I'm like, all right, score. About five minutes later, I While was While you were going, preaching. While I was preaching, yes, up front, we were at meetings. I'm standing up there preaching, and I'm, gonna, I'm starting to go like this, and I'm dancing, and Melanie's looking at me kind of funny, like, stand still, and I'm going, <gasps> I was on fire. I looked like I'd had a severe sunburn on my legs, and it was the oregano oil was burning my skin, and it lasted for a couple Please hours. Use the carrier oil. Yeah, mix it with the carrier oil. And you can use a little oregano, but I probably had 40 or 50 drops per leg of carrier good stuff. Carrier oil or boiling carrier oil? No. Carrier oil, like coconut oil, olive oil, something to thin it down with before you rub something it. Something to dilute it with. To dilute it. Um, yeah, it helps protect the skin and doesn't burn the skins and whatnot. Yeah. But eucalyptus, citronella, um, those, are, those are my two favorite when it comes to a natural repellent. Another question? Hang on. We're not here on the mic. Go ahead. You got it? Is it on? Click and Push hold. and hold. When it lights, staying. All right. Okay. So, what if it's um, what if it's just coconut oil, like? I think coconut oil alone will probably help a little, just because you've got a layer there. But from my experience, I've I don't think it's enough by itself. Mm. It's going to take something else added to it. Petroleum. What? Petroleum. Petroleum. No. I'd write the only place that we recommend using Vaseline. Petroleum jelly. Petroleum jelly is for the fire starting with the cotton balls. Petroleum. We, we demonstrated yesterday. We use the petroleum jelly for doing this because it burns well and it makes a great fire starter. Petroleum jelly should never be put on the outside or the inside of your body. The, num the dyes from the petroleum products should never be used. They are ca uh, carcinogenic. carcinogenic. They will cause cancer. A lot of people that we've taken care of over the years with cancer, that's what they rub on their skin. If you want skin cancers, breast cancers, uh, nose cancers, use petroleum jelly. Simple question, as far as um, ticks and mosquitoes, is there a combo mix something would help? Would... Um, that's what we were just talking about with the, like with the coconut oil mixed with the essential herbs. Oh. By the way, how many of you know what yarrow is? Anybody? Okay, you know what yarrow is? Kind of a, it doesn't really have a leaf, it's more like a little fins with a white flower, it's lots of like little tiny white flowers, yeah, kind of like a fern type leaf. Um, we could show you a picture of it. I don't have it ready to be able to put up on the screen or anything. But if you take yarrow and you find some of that and you rub it on the skin. It bruises it up as it, it goes bruise, on You kind of bruise it, mash it as you rub it on. It kind of makes you look a little green. Uh, but it works great. It is the best natural insect repellent that I have found. It only lasts just doing it that way a couple hours. But when we were out west, yarrow grew prolific everywhere and when we had when we did have mosquitoes in the spring and whatnot we just rub on yarrow and keep on walking and problem solved interestingly enough god has put in nature the remedies that we need you get into stinging nettle you have um, right um, next to stinging nettle always grows mullein and you may not recognize those names, but look it up. You rub, if you get into stinging nettle and you're stinging from that and whatnot, grab a mullein leaf, rub the mullein on the affected area, problem solved, goes away. Um, 
Mullen also works for poison ivy, poison oak, um, and also so does hound's tongue. As far as rubbing, the hound's tongue is a soft leaf. Um, they're, they're obnoxious. There's lots of different names for the hound's tongue. I think that's the more common name. Um, Velcro weed is another name um, that hitchhikers, they call them different things. They'll, you get into them and they're these little round burrs that stick to your clothing and are such a nuisance. But the leaves are awesome for a remedy for po poison oak, poison ivy. But clothing, so before we finish up here, we've got just a few minutes left. One of the things that we have found that's important, and that is long pants and long sleeves. And some people might think I'm a little bit crazy on this, but uh, if you believe in the spirit of prophecy, you can go on our table over there. We have Christian Temperance Bible Hygiene uh, publication. I think there's still some there. You can, especially in there, it's also scattered throughout the testimonies. You will find that she recommends long sleeves and full length pants because if you cover the limbs equally, so in other words, not, three, not wearing a vest. Okay, say so we have a cool morning outside. It's uh, 45 degrees, a little ch or 40 degrees, it's a little chilly. And a lot of guys, they'll, they'll put on a vest. Not a dress vest, but a, you know, a puffy like coat type vest. Okay, worst thing you can do. That, some will say, oh, it makes me warm. But what it, and it may kind of sort of help with that, but what you will also notice is, is health problems because you're heating the blood here. So the blood goes out to the limbs, it gets very, very cold, comes back to the body. Weakens the heart. Weakens the heart, it weakens the organs. Ellen and White explains a short, lot about that. Short pants, short sleeves. Same thing. Same scenario. Ladies. But then what if, what if you wear long sleeve and a vest? Same thing, because you've got more you layers here. You need more here. layers on your arms than you have you on your chest. You want double layers here and here on the legs and single in the trunk of the body. We tried that. We read in the Spirit of Prophecy where she talks about double layers of flannel. So we went looking. Flannel, what did they mean by flannel? Is it the same thing that we know of as no. like flannel pajamas? No. The answer is no. It is not the same thing. Flannel is wool. Light. So what we did with that's it was a lightweight wool. So what we tried soft light wool. is I took, uh, Melanie took I should say some of my uh, cotton long johns. We lived in the Northwest, cold climate. I was often out working in the winter time when where it was quite chilly, and she sewed wool on up against the skin on the sleeves and on the legs. So the trunk of the body was not covered with the wool, just my arms. So I would go to work in the morning, I would have my long johns on with wool from the groin down and from the armpits down to the wrists. Okay, everywhere else was not. Then I'd have a shirt and a pair of jeans on and I'd grab a wool stocking cap. Um, I remember one job in particular, and the reason why I remember it so well is it was the first one that I'd actually worn double layers. I had to do what we call rescrewing the roof. It was a metal roof and all the screws were bad. And so I'm up on the roof. It was snowing and sleeting on me. I was having a hard time staying on the roof because roofs tend to be pitched. It wasn't real steep or I'd have never been able to stay up there. But it had enough pitch that I was constantly working at not sliding off the roof, using the screws to hook my shoes on to help hold me on the roof. It was 33 degrees, and I did not have a coat on. I didn't have insulated overalls on. I just had a flannel shirt, and I'm talking today's flannel of, you know, that you would go and buy from Walmart type of thing, and a pair of jeans with my insulated, specially designed insulated long johns. And I worked out there in that. The lady of the house, she came out a couple of times, are you okay up there? It's awfully cold out here. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing fine. Um, at one point, the temperature dropped. I got more sleet. I went and grabbed a pair of wool gloves and took my knife and cut the fingertips off on, on my left hand. 
yeah, on the left hand, I cut the index finger and the thumb off so that I could get my fingers out to grab the screws. the screws. And uh, of course they unraveled and I threw them away at the end of the day. But I had grabbed those, had them out, had them on, and they were just lightweight military surplus wool gloves. Anyway, um, I worked out there all day dressed like that. She was amazed that I would be so warm um, and fine. And she just knew I had to be freezy. It kept inviting me in for a cup of hot coffee, which I didn't drink anyway and wouldn't have drank even if I was cold. Um, wouldn't have helped, not really. But anyway, I did fine with that double layer. So I tried something. Long sleeves, long pants. Now I'm the guy that used to wear t-shirts, sometimes sleeveless t-shirts with jeans that were cut off halfway between the knee and the, and the groin when I was on a roof working in the summertime in 100 plus degree weather. And roof temperatures, just to give you an example, we were playing with it. Um, I have a, for my home inspections, I have a uh, thermal um, sensing infrared uh, gun and I can just point it at something and take the temperature. So we were on a roof, it was 78 degrees outside. This is just here, what, two months ago? Yeah. And we're just doing a little repair job and uh, it was hot up there. We were sweating really good. So I did a temperature of the roof surface. The roof surface was 140, I think it was. Yes. 140. Yeah, the roof surface roof. was like 140 or 142. The black tar paper surface was 186. So that's what we're working above is 180 in a, 70, in a 78 degree day. And I'm used to working on roofs at over 100 degrees. And I thought, oh, there's no way I could ever, this was years and years ago, no way I could go to long sleeve shirts and long pants up there. I'm gonna die of heat exhaustion on that roof. No, I didn't wear insulated underwear or anything, just shirt and jeans like what I'm wearing today. I'm actually cooler wearing the long sleeves and the long pants. Now there's another benefit beside that, which to me this is makes all the difference. Because I was willing, even if I was a little hotter, that it would be worth it. Because let's say that uh, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make up a crazy example here, just to give you a, a crazy wild example. Let's say all of a sudden the phone goes off We've got a tornado coming straight at us, coming right straight at us. We, we step out here on the porch, we look out, and we can see that thing coming. And everybody decides to run away, okay? Whichever direction they scatter to get away from it, because there's no basements that I know of here that we could run to. There was actually a tornado in this area, and I know of one couple They told me they went and got in the bathtub in their room. I'm not sure how much that would have helped them, but it was, I guess, something anyway. So there's really no, nothing for a shelter. So let's say we decide to head out here to the woods. And it comes through here and just annihilates everything. Roads are blocked off. Nobody can get in here. The buildings are demolished. Stuff scattered. You've got what you've got on your person. OK? So those of us that are dressed in long pants and long sleeve shirts when it comes evening and it starts chilling off, we're going to be doing much, much better than those that are dressed, sorry to pick on you, but like you are in a t-shirt, okay? Um, makes a huge difference. All I got to do is this. Yeah, there you go. Pull the arm on the inside of the never sleeves. Know, never underestimate. <laughs> I love it. So it it makes a big difference um, in what we do. And one more point I was going to make a little a minute ago or so. Um, guys, I hope I don't, well, actually, maybe I should say girls. Hopefully, I don't embarrass you. But this is a fact of life. And that is ladies, especially when it comes to the children, the, the little girls. You always see these little girls that mama has in arms and whatnot or whatever, and they have these cutesy little mini skirts on, and their arms and their legs are exposed. 
If you want to create a woman who has a lot of PMS, PMS menstrual problems, pain, um, debility, keep, their limbs, keep their limbs uncovered. Cover their limbs up, um, clothe them properly, keep their limbs warm, and when that time of their life comes, there will be little to no issue. It is, it's, you can read it in Spirit of Prophecy, you can read it in science literature, but how to live, um, health and how to live. How to live, there's doctor's journals in there saying the same thing from the 1800s. Yeah, health and how to live talks about it. That child and she, you won't have to call me to give her a pill to get rid of her pain. So how we dress, because this, this whole time, this period, and the reason we put it together with the, the drone and the infrared connected with clothing is because what we wear, um, not only, I mean, we could go to the level of clothing, um, and, and I've actually said this, so I can, two individuals, I'm gonna, I'll say it in public night now, um, I've said it to young ladies, if you're not advertising, why are you dressed like that? And I would hope you understand what I mean by saying that. When you dress provocatively, and men can do it too, they're not exempt anymore. It used to be guys weren't that way, but it's not that way anymore. When you dress provocatively, you are um, advertising. And as Christians, it's a wrong thing to be advertising. So whether we're talking about the looks and how we're perceived, or whether we're talking about our health and our health benefits, or whether we're talking about being able to survive if we end up out, uh, we don't have to be talking about an end time scenario of running, fleeing to the woods for our lives or whatever. We can be talking about a Sabbath afternoon hike that goes bad. We hike down, in, down into a canyon with a bunch of friends. We go maybe three miles, and somebody breaks a leg down there because they stumbled or break, broke their ankle. And it's, it's 6 o'clock in the evening because we know we got a couple hours till sunset, so that's no problem. We have plenty of time to hike out. You know, everybody's fit, but somebody ends up injured or somebody got bit by a snake or something, suddenly that whole picture can change and it can go from a fun time to a survival situation. And if you have a little bit of a few things with you that can help something to build a fire, something, uh, proper clothing, um, even some flimsy, uh, and, and that's something I should, give out here. We got, just so everybody could have it, I got a whole bunch of emergency blankets. They do work. I carry two of them in, two or three of them in my medical, or in my backpack. I carry also some of them. Um, Where my medical bags Our medical bags are here. That one's mine. Yeah, this one's Matt's. But anyway, um, in our medical kits, we carry a couple in here for an emergency. Because what happens with somebody, and we're going to talk about med first aid and whatnot, but if somebody goes into shock, awesome little tool. They're very, very light. Um, they work amazingly well. And so anyway, um, proper clothing is it's life-saving all the way around. Whether we're talking about the spiritual aspect of what we should do, whether we're talking about the physical, our health, or whether we're talking about um, avoiding um, detection, if it comes, I won't say if, when it comes to that point, because it will come to that point. Um, give me half a second, and then we'll go with your question. We need the microphone out here again. Um, the uh, Okay, that thought left me. That's okay. Um, over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, what about helicopters? Uh, Are they able to is the mic off turned on. off again? Click and hold on the bottom of it. Push and hold the bottom till the light on the side, the number comes, shows up. What about helicopters? Can they find people 
They have this the same basic technology that you were watching here on the television screen. Um, their cameras, probably military, obviously they're running instead of a whole drone that's at, you know, they're running a million dollar helicopter with uh, um, a lot higher quality cameras. So the imagery becomes better, becomes clearer. You saw Matt when he zoomed in on the airport a mile and a half away. It, uh, um, it's, we had some blurry issues there a little bit, and then it kind of cleared up a bit, but it still wasn't crystal clear. They're going to have the technology to make things crystal clear. Um, but as long as you stay still, it'll help. Yes. If, so knowing just some basic things, knowing to step into the woods. I mean, literally, when Matt was having me there, I was literally my body length away from standing out in the open grass. I was only that far into the woods, and I just, and I just stood there. Actually, I had my phone like this. I had it up here like that. I just stood here like this, and you all saw I just disappeared. Yeah. Um, Something else, if you're avoiding, say, people on the ground um, searching for you, and this is also really works for hide and seek, um, don't make eye contact with them. If you're looking at their face and they can't see you, say you're behind a brush pile or something and you can see through and you're watching their face and you end up making eye contact with them, their brain will say, someone just looked at me and they're over there. Oh, wow. So yeah. avoid, Never, avoid eye contact. If you want to look at them, look at their um, feet, but don't look at their head. Another one, you all saw in my pack that those that were here um, saw that I carry cayenne, a uh, little bottle of cayenne in my pack. Uh, there's multiple reasons. Um, it's awesome for heart attack. It's awesome for cuts, um, cuts Cauterized for bleeding. stopping bleeding. Um, taking it internally, if you're trying to stop an internal bleed, you can use the cayenne. It also works really, really well for um, deterring dogs. You got dogs on your track? Leave a Take little a cayenne spritz with... of cayenne and just across your trail as you're going. That dog <laughs> will be sniffing along. <laughs> They'll be a snot and mess, and by the time they get through snotting, they will have lost your trail. I got a question. Yes, sir. Now, okay, I've heard from Dr. Schultz. Well, I, I got two questions to address. Okay. Dr. Schultz, I don't know if you guys heard of Dr. Yes. Schultz. He's saying that the medicinal form of cayenne has to be an international heat unit of over, you know, the 90,000 international heat units. That's the, the cooking cayenne, the one that has a medicinal property that helps with, you know, expanding the arteries and circulation would be like, you know, anywhere from 150 and more. 300. To 300. 390, yeah. Yeah. A good amount. So. Okay. I, okay, my simple, simple answer. I'll answer that one first before I forget okay. it. So simple answer. And that is... If you have less heat, you need more of it. If you have more heat, you need less. So the, it varies the volume. I believe they're still medicinal. I've seen um, Melanie helped a lady who was having a heart attack. She did it over the telephone with her. And she used um, cooking-based cayenne in water and was drinking it every few minutes. The next, she, her husband was there, but she didn't want to wake him up. She calls Melanie, and she would not go do it. And kind of a stubborn German lady, but anyway. Um, the next morning, he finds out what had happened, and he's, I'm taking you into the hospital to get checked. So they take her in, they go, well, the antibodies in your blood indicate that you've had a heart attack, but I don't quite understand it because there's no damage to your heart at all. Mm -hmm. And all she did was, so that was cayenne. Heat and that was, was the lower heat that was wow. the lower heat unit cayenne. That's amazing. But every 15 minutes That's she amazing. had her drinking a heaping tablespoon in water and she'd say, "Oh, it's hot. It's hot. I can't do this." At 2 a.m. I was on the phone with her. Yeah. And she took it with water. Yeah. yeah. she took it with water. Yes. And she took it with water. Yeah. Um, so your second how much peppers did she uh, ingest? A spoonful. She had a little bottle of it. She used the whole thing. Hmm. By the time she was wow. Wow. Yeah. She was using, I don't know. A teaspoon. A teaspoon, a heaping teaspoonful every 15 minutes. And then it, as time went on, she started, as she started feeling a little better, and by, she started taking a little less. And by 2 a.m., she was saying, 
Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm really tired, she said. It's like, well, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> um, so anyway, it, uh, so yeah, more, it's right. just going to take more to do the same thing. By the way, it really does clotterize bleeding. We've seen that. I've used it on a deer uh, that was, a dog had gotten into and they're just bleeding out the juggler vein and whatnot. We stopped it with cayenne. <laughs> um, wow. I've That's amputated amazing. a leg on a lamb that got tore up by the herding dogs, and we had a main bleed. We cauterized it. Um, the sheep became tripod, is what we called her. And but she, would it, that be excruciatingly uh, painful with cayenne on exactly on the site of where a rupture, you know, like? When um, you're in shock? Seconds, yes, then it goes numb. Really? <laughs> yes. It burns for a little bit, numb. and then it goes dumb. And I have used it on some pretty severe cuts on myself. So uh, I've, I've cut my thumbnail off and done. My, my other question was, okay, so if the dogs are following you, if they're sniffing, they're trying to seek you out to find you as if you're, a, you know, after you like a criminal, and you have the, the cayenne, you just sprinkle it, it'll cause them to just like sniff and like sneeze the dogs, or would it cause yeah. them to like... Have you ever sniffed to, it up your nose? Have you ever sniffed cayenne up your nose? No, I know. It, it's very... <laughs> I know, I know. It, they they you'll have the same effect. Oh, okay. That's what I'm really we got one wanting there. to know. Okay. She needs some ideas. Yeah. Okay. Pass it over there. Can you use a uh, cayenne in case you got a snake bite, like in a survival, something like that? Um, I've never heard of using cayenne for a snake bite. Matt's got the. We use something, we'll, and we'll talk about it. We'll get over here. One. Um, We'll talk about it a little bit more maybe this afternoon, or maybe we just do it now and not talk about it later. So this is called do it later. the extractor. Time. It's a for bee stings. It's for um, the uh, for snake bites. There's different tips that go on it. I want to. I want the big one because they can see it better from a distance. So they've got different shaped deals. If you have a bee sting or a snake bite, or a snake bite it can be administered to yourself. It's like a syringe that works in reverse. You can see how it's popped the skin up on his arm. That will pull off That'll pull the, the it pulls out. the po poison out. I've never had the opportunity to use it on a snake bite. On a snake bite. But I have used it for I'm going to say the name of it? extractor. Where would you get one of them? Amazon, Rite Aid, Rite Aid used to. I don't know if they still do. Um, the the pharmacies and whatnot. Um, this one came off of Amazon. It was a little fancier pack, and I thought, oh, that would be really nice. I'm looking for my other medical kit. If if it's a bee sting, you want to use the smaller tip, like what Matt has it on right now. And the only thing is, you need to get to it, we found usually under two minutes if you really want it to be effective. Right. Here's a different, this is the style, the way the cases looked years ago. This is an older one. I, you might even still be able to get them this way. Uh, I kind of like actually how the mountings for it were. Um, comes with a razor. I've never used it, and I, I mean, you can put it on a hairy arm or whatever. But these work great. People that go normally would need an EpiPen because they go into anaphylactic shock. If you use this on them quickly enough, they won't need their EpiPen. I've seen it over and over time. I started out using this back in the 80s, 86, 87. 87, I started using these. And I've used them over and over and over again on people. Melanie is highly allergic. Her bronchi shut down. The other thing you can do, I'm sure most of you have heard of yeah, echinacea. If you have somebody that's, and you don't have an EpiPen available, or like my wife, if you were to put an EpiPen in, here, in her, it would kill her. She's, high, she's more allergic to the adrenaline than she is the bee sting. And so we use the extractor and we use echinacea and large doses of echinacea. And it will stabilize and take care of the problem. The last time she's been was stung was years ago um, now that, she, that we had to use the echinacea. And we've gone over time by just a couple of minutes. 
So I think we had another question. I'll go ahead. How about uh, if you have a, like a dog bite? Is that also applicable? Yes. Like rabid dog or you don't know, strange um, dog? The, oh. A rabid dog, I suppose maybe you could use that on it. My they first instinct with, with a rabid dog would be to go to charcoal. Charcoal, charcoal. charcoal flaxseed blended together or charcoal and honey if you don't have the flaxseed or some the the honey or the flaxseed is just to help keep the charcoal moist if you're out in the woods and you don't happen to have any activated charcoal with you use the charcoal out of your fire pit it's not activated but it is charcoal and if you don't happen to have flaxseed that you can grind up or any honey or anything to put in with it you'll just have to change it more often cuz Charcoal poultice stops working when it is dry. So if it's wet, it's still working. So you might have to put, okay, on the arm. The dog grabs you here in the arm and you put a big old charcoal poultice on it. You grab out some bandaging or you use something, bandage it up. And you might have to pour some water on the bandages. Keep the bandages wet so that the charcoal continue to pull. One Another thing you can do if you're in a like a campsite situation, add some mud to it. If you're near a creek or something, add some clay or mud to it. That will keep it moist. That'll help. And also it will have some drawing power. Yeah, clay is powerful with for drawing. Um, okay, we should probably finish up so that we can try to stay on schedule. Next, we're, so we're going to take um, um, the next meeting is at 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock, and we're going to talk about tool sharpening and how to sharpen knives and hatchets and axes and and. We had a question best. at breakfast time, and the people will be coming back if they can bring their own whetstones, and you can teach them how to sharpen their own tools with their own whetstones. You bet. Yeah. In fact, okay. I would prefer. And we'll pull some things out here and let you play with it um, to practice to practice doing that because um, the right tool for the right job and practice, practice, practice. It's with anything. If you're a, a firefighter, they take you out and they practice. You practice it. If you're in the military, you practice. If you're an EMT, you practice. If you're a surgeon, you practice. If you're a contractor, you go and you apprentice or you work with somebody, you're practicing so that you learn how to do it. So that, specifically speaking, if a um, emergency happens, you will then not have to go, oh, let's see here. Now, how do I make a charcoal poultice? You know, it seems like th there isn't any of that. It's, it becomes automatic. You're just doing it. And after the fact, you go, wow. And, and, and I can honestly say that. Um, I've been a firefighter, wildland fighter fighter. Uh, I've been trained as an EMT. I'm not currently either, so I can't say I'm an EMT. But yeah, I've forgotten some of the training. It's been quite a few years ago, like with the EMT. Um, but a lot of it's still there. And I can guarantee that if I'm driving down the highway, highway and I come upon a vehicle accident and I'm the first person on site, or the second or third, whatever, that's on site, I will automatically go to doing what I've been trained to do. And so when it comes to all of this stuff, you have to train yourself. Use it, practice it, uh, play with it. You know, if you never ever go camping, you're not going to be able to um, be able to go out there and do things. So we should finish up and and we can visit and talk about things, but we should stop with the meeting at this point. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you praising and thanking you so much for leading. And for the things we've been able to share, we pray, Father, that as we've talked about the physical, that you'll not allow us to forget about you and that ultimately you are our shield to protect us from whether it be cameras or infrared or whether it be the dogs that may be on our track or, or whatever that it may be. We just praise you that you are there 
to shield us. Help us to do our part so that you then can follow through and do your part and fill our, our lack. Bless and direct us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.